بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين حبيب إله العالمين أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين الذين أذهب الله عنهم الرجس وطهرهم تطهيرا واللعنة الدائمة على أعدائهم أجمعين من الآن إلى قيام يوم الدين قال الله تعالى في كتابه الكريم وقوله الحق Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states in the Holy Quran and what he says is the truth in the chapter of Fussila chapter 41 verse 53 سنريهم آياتنا في Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states in this blessed verse he says we shall show them our signs within the horizons and within themselves until it is made apparent and clear to them that He is the truth. Is it not sufficient for them that Allah bears witness over all things? Sadaqallahu al-Aliyu al Brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Insha'Allah in these upcoming episodes, our goal will be to establish a strong foundation in theology. Our goal is to use our intellects this important creation that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us so that we can rationalize and reach the truths that Allah wants us to reach. Now, we can prove Allah through the Holy Qur'an, but who's to say that we believe in the Holy Qur'an in the first place? Of course, us Muslims believe in the Holy Qur'an, but we grow up believing in the Holy Qur'an because our parents tell us to. We grow up believing in Allah because our parents tell us to. But at a certain point in our growth, when we get to, let's say, our first level college philosophy class, when we're truly questioned and we're asked to prove the existence of Allah and the legitimacy of the Holy Quran and our entire belief system, that it becomes very hard for us to prove it. And therefore, our goal today really will be to help us understand how it is that we can use our intellects to prove God's existence, to prove the legitimacy of the Holy Quran, to prove prophethood, to prove imama, to prove God's justice and the day of judgment using our intellects. The intellects are very important in Islam. Islam does not require us to retire our minds and just accept on blind faith. Therefore, anyone who tells you to accept anything on blind faith is truly one who doesn't understand Islam in its full entirety. Actually, the very first narration that is mentioned in, our, in one of our four books of hadith called Al-Kafi, the very first hadith refers to the creation of the intellect. It is a hadith that is narrated by Muhammad ibn Muslim by way of Al-Imam Al-Baqir alayhi salam, in which he states, أَوَّلْ مَا خَلَقَ اللَّهُ الْعَقْلَ إِسْتَنْطَقَهُ When Allah first created the intellect, He gave it the ability to think and rationalize or to speak. He then said to it, ثُمَّ قَالَ لَهُ أَقْبِلْ فَأَقْبَلْ he said to it, go forth, and it went forth. And then he said to it, turn around. فَقَالَ لَهُ أَدْبِرْ فَأَدْبَرْ As though he was admiring it. And then he said, وَعِزَّتِي وَجَلَالِي By my grandeur and majesty. مَا خَلَقْتُ خَلْقًا أَحَبُّ إِلَيَّ مِنْكَ Surely I did not create a creation that is more beloved to me than you. وَمَا أَكْمَلْتُكَ إِلَّا فِي مَنْ أُحِبْ Neither have I completed you except in those whom I love. فَإِيَّاكَ أَمُرْ For it is you that I command. وَإِيَّاكَ أَنْهَا And it is you that I forbid. وَإِيَّاكَ أُعَاقِبْ وَإِيَّاكَ أُثِيبْ For it is you that I punish and it is you that I reward. Therefore we see that in Islam the intellect is king. We believe in the importance of the intellect. Therefore we must not retire our intellects. That means we must always be in a state of inquisition, of asking, of curiosity. Of course curious about things that are important to us, not curious about other people's business that is none of our business. So how is it that we can prove the existence of Allah? In order to prove the existence of Allah, we will, we will employ an empirical method. Because you know, there are many empirical philosophers or empiricists who have stopped at the empirical and not looked beyond into the intellectual reasoning in order to prove Allah's existence or God Almighty's existence. And therefore we will use an empirical methodology in order to show those empiricists that you can use empirical methods to prove the existence of Allah. All empirical means is that we're going to use examples. 
multiple examples from physical and materialistic um, existence that will allow us to come to certain realities if we intellectualize and rationalize the proper way. So let's get started. The first proof is called the proof of organization. In Arabic, this is called Burhan al nadam This is a very easy proof. And if I tell you to take an orange and cut it in half and look at it, once you look at it and you see how symmetrical it looks, all of the different parts of the orange, you can agree with me that it does look organized, does it not? Of course, you'll say yes. Now, how about an onion? If I cut it in half and I look at it, I will find that its layers, how beautifully organized they are, truly are a sign of organization. Therefore, I can say that the onion is organized, is it not? Of course, you'll say yes and agree. How about if I look at the cells of the onion under a microscope? I'll see that they're, that they're laid together one by the other, just as bricks are. And each nucleus you can see under the microscope, exactly similar to the other one next to it. Surely, that is a sign of organization. So we can agree then that even cells are organized. Now, if I look at a flower, I'll find that the flower itself, like a daisy, if I look at it, it truly looks symmetrical. So that means that it's organized. So I'm sure you'll agree with me on that. What about the sun rising from the east and setting in the west? Of course, that is also an organized system. These are org all organized empirical examples. What about the solar system? With all the planets circumambulating around the sun, surely that is an example, a true example of an organized system. Therefore, I can say that the world, this, the universe, the solar system is organized. So I can safely agree then, we can safely agree that the world is organized based on the examples that we looked at. So let's set that aside. The next series of questions that I'll ask you are very simple ones also. Who organizes your room? You'll say to me, I do, or my mother does, or my wife does. Then I'll ask you, well, who organizes the doctor's office? You'll answer and say the nurse or the uh, assistant. If I ask you and say who organizes the mosque, you'll say the administrators or the janitors. If I ask you who organizes your bed, you'll say, I do. Therefore, we can agree that for something to be organized, there has to be a creator of its organization. So let's review. First of all, we agreed that the world is organized. Secondly, we said that everything that is organized has a creator of its organization. The first is our minor premise, the second is our major premise. The world is organized, Everything that is organized has a creator of its organization. Therefore, the world has a creator of its organization. And so we were able to prove that the world has a creator of its organization. Great. What's the next question that comes to mind then? The next question that comes to mind is very simple. What is the quintessential, most important characteristic that this creator would have to have? And who is this creator? So first I would ask, who is this creator? Then what is the most important characteristic that he must have? So I ask myself, did I create this world? Now I recognize that I don't have all the knowledge possible to know what or how my day is going to be tomorrow or whether I'm still going to be alive. So I can safely say that it can't be me because I know that I'm in need. I know that I'm in need of knowledge. I know that I'm in need of food. I know that I'm in need of drink. I know that I'm in need of um, happiness and security and shelter. So I know that I'm in need. So I look at my parents. I look at them because they brought me to this world. They created me. So they are creators. But are they the creators of the universe, of this entire existence? And I figure out that no, they can't be because they suffer from the same weaknesses and limitations that I face. What about their parents? The same problem. What about their parents? The same issue. And as I go upward in my lineage, what do I find as I go back into my lineage? I find that it can't be anyone who's human because all humans are limited. So I look beyond them. I find that this world and everything within it is limited. Everything has a beginning and an end in this limited world. Land masses have a beginning and an end. Time has a beginning and an end. And therefore, I recognize that everything in this system is limited. I then ask myself, 
Well, what about things that are created? Who creates them and what is the essential characteristic of he who creates anything? When I look at an engine, for example, and I think of an engineer, I find that the engineer definitely is not inside that thing that he creates, that engine, when he creates it. Also, if I think of a cookie, for example, and I love cookies, I'm sure you do, a baker, when they bake a cookie, are they inside the cookie that they bake when they bake it? Of course the answer is no. What about a cook? Are they inside the food that they cook when they cook it? The answer again is no. Therefore, I can get a general rule out of these examples, these empirical examples, is that the creator of something is not inside that which he creates when he creates it. So let me extrapolate now. Let me go back to my original problem. And that's who created this universe. Now I know that everything that is created, its creator is not inside that item that is created when they create it, right? A painter isn't inside the painting that they paint when they paint it, right? An engineer isn't inside the engine that they design once they design it. Therefore, the creator of this limited world was not inside the world of limitation when he created it, which means that he has to be unlimited, you see? The creator of all things, the creator of all creations, the greatest creator, the most supreme creator of all, he who does not have a creator must not be inside the limited world of creation when he created it. Yes, he is therefore unlimited, which means that he's everywhere. That gives me the most important characteristic of this creator, and that's that he's unlimited, which means that he's all perfect, that he's all knowing, that he's all wise, that he's everywhere. The next issue is, well, if he's unlimited, I know that limited things are changing. Everything in this limited world changes, at the very least in existence as it pertains to time, right? Well, if he is unlimited and he's not um, part of the world of limitation, then that means what? That means that he is unchanging. That means that he's everywhere. That means that he has no limit. He, that he, no limit. He doesn't have a beginning. He doesn't have an end. He existed before all things. He exists after all things. He exists when nothing else exists. Of course, after he creates what he creates, he's everywhere. Because whatever is created now exists within the realm of his existence. You see? But he doesn't mix with anything. Because him mixing with something means that he is limited. So he's not limited at all. He's unlimited. All perfect. All knowing. All purposeful. All worthy. All just. Therefore, if he chooses for me to exist, then that is the best decision. It is the most perfect decision. Because the all perfect chose for me to exist. Therefore, I am worthy. Because Allah is all purposeful, that means this creator, when he created me, he created me for a purpose, the best of purposes. The fact that Allah is all just then means that his decision to create me was the most just and the most fair decision of all. Now that I understand this, the next question is, well, what about those who speak about chaos and chaos theory? Does chaos exist? The answer is no. There's no such thing as chaos theory. How? We mentioned that the world is organized and everything in this organized system follows the perfect system that God created for it. Therefore, any semblance that we might think is necessarily chaos really isn't chaos. It's a supreme form of organization. A man by the name of Benoit Mendelbrot, who held the position of Einstein, Albert Einstein, and has over 15 PhDs determined that anything that looks random to you actually is not. It's a supreme form of organization. There is no chaos. Inshallah, in the next episode, we'll take a look at how we're able to prove that there's no chaos at all in existence. I ask that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us the ability to improve our intellects and use them so that we can reach higher planes of knowledge, so that we can come closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so that we can be rightfully guided on the straight path. As-sirat al-mustaqeen wa akhiru da'wana an alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa salatu wa salamu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala ali bayti al-tayyibin al-tahirin wa al-fatiha ala arwah al-marhumin masbuqatan bil-salati ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad.